and welcome to the 17th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Firstly, the committee will observe a minute silence at 11 this morning as a mark of respect to those who died and those who have been affected by the incident in London on Saturday evening. I will therefore suspend the meeting just before 11 a.m. and a tannoy announcement will be made at the start and end of the silence. Before we move to the first item of the agenda, I would like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones, etc., as they may affect the broadcasting system. The committee has received apologies today from our colleagues Morris Golden, Kate Forbes and David Stewart. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The second item of business on our agenda today is to hear evidence from the Scottish Government on the Loch Carran Urgent Marine Conservation Order 2017, SSI 2017-158. I welcome Michael McLeod, Head of Marine Conservation at the Scottish Government today. Uh, members will have a series of questions to put to you this morning. Maybe the other uh, issues are identified by those questions and your answers, um, which may lead us to write to you seeking further clarification. That may or may not be the case. Um, so to begin, could you outline for us why the urgency with this order? Did the government feel that there was likely to be a repetition of the, uh, these incidents? I mean, I, th I think the, the way to look at that is that a repeat couldn't be ruled out. Now, if it happened again, it would be um, bad for the environment. I think it would be bad for the government, and it would also be bad for the, the fishing industry. So the easiest way to ensure uh, that it can't happen again is to put in place management measures to control that activity. OK. The two points that arise from that, um, there were two incidents... Uh, can I ask, was it the same vessel um, that was involved in the two incidents? And also, what sort of percentage of the area of the flame beds has been damaged? On the first point, we believe it was the same vessel on both occasions. Certainly, the data from the vessel monitoring system, which um, most of the vessels um, in the Scottish fleet have on board, places that vessel in the area on two different occasions. Um, on the second question, um, we, we don't know exactly how much yet. Um, the, the survey work that was done, there was a mixture of dive surveys, so divers looking at, at the damage, but there was also high-definition video footage taken by Marine Scotland Science. There has to be a considerable amount of analysis done, first of all, to establish how much of the bed remains and how much would appear to be damaged. And that work is uh, ongoing at present. But in terms of ballpark, are we talking about 50% that's been damaged, less? I, I wouldn't like to put a figure on that today. OK. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Yes, um, Convener, good morning, Mr McLeod. Uh, it states in the policy note that it could take over 100 years for flame shell beds to recover from just one uh, pass of uh, scallop dredge fishing gear. Um, so, I mean, clearly this MCO is in place for, for two years, but presumably um, little recovery will take place in, in that two years. Um, what are Marine Scotland's plans once the MCO has expired? Can, can it be uh, re reissued? The short answer is yes. So, first of all, the, the, the urgent designation of the Marine Protected Area that can only last for a maximum of two years um, as well. So between now and two years' time, we will need to um, take forward the designation of Loch Carran as a, a proper full nature conservation MPA and also put in place the necessary management measures uh, for, for the long-term um, recovery of the habitat. OK, so... With regard to MPAs um, and this MCO, what, what would you say uh, to, to critics that suggest all the areas that have been closed to dredging in the past have achieved nothing uh, except the creation of marine deserts populated by starfish and the inevitable overfishing of the remaining areas? And I'm thinking in particular of Broad Bay, because in, a, in the Western Isles in, in Lewis, because we took evidence on that specific issue um, some time ago in the previous session of Parliament, uh, and there were claims that uh, you know, these areas just create seabeds full of starfish? Um, well, I have not seen the evidence that, or, or evidence of a scientific survey of Broad Bay, either from before its closure, which I think was in 1989, um, and I've not seen a full survey of the area 
um, since. There's been occasional um, partial survey work, um, not by um, for biodiversity purposes. It was um, a scallop stock survey, and obviously they took up some starfish in their halls and not very many scallops. Um, whether that's enough evidence to say that it turns the seabed into um, marine deserts, um, I, I would say not. Okay, for, just for the record, some of that evidence was shared with this committee in the previous session. Thank you. Beamish. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr. McLeod. Uh, could I ask you, um, first of all, I, I welcome the swift designation by the Scottish Government. Um, could I ask you what information is available to the fishing industry in relation to priority marine features which are out with uh, marine protected areas in order for them to ensure that they don't intrude onto those and uh, how that's distributed to the fishing industry? There is a considerable amount of evidence relating to priority marine features on uh, the National Marine Plan Interactive um, web mapping tool, um, which is hosted on the Scottish Government website. You can look at data layers for the various habitats and species that are priority marine features. Mm -hmm. so, so would you say that this is information that is ready avail readily available and has been highlighted to uh, the fishing industry through their organisations and in other ways through uh, local community groups or whatever? Because um, with the best will in the world, people need the information in order to be able to um, respect um, the environmental concerns. I absolutely um, agree with, with that. And, and I think that's something that myself and my team and our partner organisations will be thinking very carefully about over the next few months is, are we providing the right information in the right format that is easily digestible for, for users of the sea? Um, and I think you can always make improvements in how you do that. Uh, and I think this incident brings that into some focus. The need to improve that. Thank you. That's helpful. Mark Roscoe. Good morning. Um, my understanding is that there are five areas, candidate areas, um, which were put forward as potential marine protected areas for flame shell reef. Two are designated, uh, two are not designated, and a further one was not designated but has now been, you know, ostensibly destroyed uh, and is now up for designation. What's the difference between those? <coughs> um, well, we have five marine protected areas for, for flame shell beds presently. Um, it's true that Loch Carron um, was under consideration during the MPA selection process. Um, it, I don't like using the term lost out, but it just came number six um, on the list. And you have to bear in mind that the MPA network wasn't meant to be about protecting everything everywhere. It was about making sure we had a, a representative sample of these key habitats and species represented in, in the network, almost like a, an insurance policy, you could, you could argue. Um, the conclusion at the time during the application of the MPA selection guidelines was that five sites was a sufficient representation at that time. Um, we have to report on the status of the MPA network next year, and, and I mean, since we designated the MPAs, we've actually discovered that flame shells have a wider range um, than they had, um, or what we thought they had back in 2012. So we will have to consider that next year as to whether we are representing uh, that habitat um, in the most appropriate manner. If you were to run that MPA process again, would Loch Caron be put forward as, a, as an MPA site, given what you know now? Um, would it still be at number six? That's hard to say. I mean, we are learning all the time about um, the various habitats and species that were the MPA search features, and, and it may be that we should have had more of some and less of others and, and so on. Um, we, we did what we felt was the correct selection at the time based upon the best available evidence that we had. Have you considered a ban on scallop dredging out to three nautical miles? Um, that would be a question for my sea fisheries policy colleagues. Um, it's, that's not my policy area. 
Um, I'm sorry for being awkward, but um, my bypass area is to ensure nature conservation, which is slightly different mm -hmm. from... OK, um, from, from a nature conservation point of view, then, has there been consideration of a ban on scarlet dredging out to three nautical miles? No. And if not, why? No, not, not at this point in time. We've never considered... Why, um, why not? Um, clearly, the focus of my team for the last number of years has been to deliver the MPA network and the management measures required to protect that network, and we haven't even completed uh, that work yet. That, that still continues. Um, I think, um, given the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to looking at how the most vulnerable priority marine features are, are managed for fisheries, then we will have to consider a whole range of different ways of delivering that, um, which may mm -hmm. um, include considering uh, a defined limit um, from, from shore. So you say that may include uh, a ban on scarlet dredging out to three nautical miles, or it may not? Well, we would have to consider what is required to deliver the, the necessary protection within the context of the National Marine Plan. And okay. that might be one way to deliver that, but um, there will be other ways also. OK. Uh, Phil and Carson. Much. Um, I find your last answer to, to Mark quite interesting. You suggested that if you were to rerun the, the the MPAs, again, that law can or may not be included in that, but we've, we've got something in front of us today which is suggesting we need to take emergency action to make that the case. Um, would that suggest that actually what this is all about is that the Cabinet Secretary has bowed to public pressure because of the adverse publicity caused by this incident being uh, right across the media and whatever? I, I wouldn't. So, if you go back to the Marine Scotland Act, Section 3 of the Marine Scotland Act um, effectively places a duty on ministers to act in a way that's best calculated to improve the health of, of the, or the Scottish marine area, I think it's defined as. So, where, where you have a, a vulnerable habitat that you now know has definitely been um, damaged, then I, I would argue that you're duty bound to to take action to um, recover that area as part of that overall drive to improve uh, Scotland's seas. So, so on the back of that, we've, we've seen um, whole-scale uh, illegal fishing of razor clams in some areas of uh, the west of Scotland. If the evidence was there to show that these razor clam beds were being damaged, would, would you bring in the same sort of order? Or is it, again, is it... Is it just easy for people to see that the flame beds were damaged and it's not quite so easy to see that razor, beds, uh, razor clam beds are, are being damaged? Where, where's the research to, to back all this up? Research in which context? Just habitat. The, 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 you know, we're suggesting here that damage it will take 100 years to recover on uh, flame shell reefs because it was very vis visible. You know, mm. the, the, the data we saw, the video evidence we saw was, was very compelling that there was damage being done. Do you carry out the same sort of research to see what might happen in razor clam beds where the, the, the same level of damage may be done but not quite so visible? Um, personally, no, not my team, um, but my co colleagues in Sea Fisheries Policy um, and Marine Scotland Science have been doing some research into um, the methods used to catch uh, razor fish and what effect that has on um, marine life on and in the seabed. Um, and, and that work uh, continues, um, as, you, as you may be aware. Any other questions? Alex Burnett. <coughs> uh, good morning. Um, I think we all understand the urgency uh, for, for the order being uh, put, in, put in place, uh, but there was no business and regulatory impact assessment carried out as would normally be expected. Uh, can you just confirm it was not carried out because of the urgency, and what plans you have to carry that out, and when you'll be able to make that available? You're absolutely right. There wasn't a, a business and regulatory impact assessment. When we bring forward um, the, uh, an updated proposal to, to make the, the designation and put in place long-term management, we will deliver a, 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 an impact assessment at that time. So you're saying there's no the two-year limit is, is what you're proposing? Yes. Okay. We'll bring it all forward together as a coherent package. Can, can I just be clear? 
is it the case that there was no reason to suspect something like this would happen? I mean, was the, the flame beds will have been known about for many years. When was the last incident, if there was one of this nature? Um, well, obviously, we don't know about... There have been incidents like this could be mm. happening on a regular basis. It's just that you, you don't get lucky or unlucky by having... Um, recreational um, diver, divers who effectively witness um, the, the incident. Um, so we don't know if it's happening elsewhere. There has been a couple of incidences previously. Um, in fact, it's the two previous occasions where we've used the urgent Marine Conservation Order powers, which was at South Arran in 2014, and then at Wester Ross in 2015, where there were incidents of metal beds. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we've finished the questioning. Um, can I invite any comments from members on this SSI? Does anybody wish to comment? No. As it's a formal comment at this stage, I'll just repeat um, the fact that I'm uh, pleased that there was um, decisive and, and quick action in this case. Right. Absolutely. Um, so can I ask that whether the committee has agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Agreed? Okay. Um, therefore, can I thank Mr McLeod for attending today? Uh, we'll now have a short break and prepare for the next panel of witnesses. Thank you. Uh, welcome back to the meeting of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We are now going to take evidence on the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill from three panels. And we've been joined initially by Dr Dorothy McKeegan, who's a senior lecturer at the Institute of Biodiversity, Animal Health and Comparative Medicine at the University of Glasgow. Good morning. Uh, Mike Radford from the University of Aberdeen had hoped to be with us but, this morning, but is unable to attend due to family circumstances. Uh, members have a series of questions to put to you, uh, Dr McKeegan. Um, again, as noted previously, there may be some issues that arise from the, the questions and answers that we may write to you about, if that's OK. So, uh, to kick off, uh, Emma Harper. Good morning. Um, I am interested in the ethical aspects of and the welfare aspects of uh, wild animals and circuses and our policy me memorandum talks about prohibiting the use, performance, display and exhibition of any wild animal as defined in the bill in a travelling circus based on ethical grounds. So I was wondering what your views would be on the proposed approach that seeks to ban wild animals using three ethical issues which is the impact on respect for animals, the impact on travelling environments, on animals' nature and the ethical costs versus benefits? Well, the three arguments as set out in the memorandum are, in my, my view, valid. Um, the first one, the impact on respect for animals, is basically using a sort of fixed ethical rules-based ideology, an animal rights type ideology, where uh, this type of use of animals is seen as disrespectful <coughs> and uh, exploitative and so on. Um, of course, that argument also applies to lots of other types of use of animals, which is a bit of an issue for this argument. But I think the, the point may be that this type of use is considered to be particularly disrespectful and um, perhaps is anthropomorphising animals and making, uh, in this is in points that young people think that animals are there to be used as a commodity um, and something that um, we can exploit in this way. Um, 
The second argument, the impact of the travelling environment on animals' nature, or telos, um, it's not very clear to me what exact ethical framework is being used to underpin this argument. Um, it seems to be much more of a welfare argument to me than an ethical argument, although those two concepts can't be fully separated here. Um, it seems to be concerned about the consequences of, of using animals in these contexts, and therefore it's a kind of outcome consequence-based argument, and it seems to be about freedoms to express normal behaviour and therefore you know, fundamental welfare concerns about behavioural restriction and, and training and so on. Um, and the third argument, the ethical costs and benefits, is a very straightforward and, in my view, the strongest of the three arguments based on utilitarian reasoning, where we can argue that an action is justified if the benefits that accrue from the action um, over are, more, are bigger than the costs. And I think that that's difficult to argue in this um, animals and travelling circuses context. Um, again, this argument can be applied to a lot of other contexts, and the memorandum talks about animals and experimentation, for which there are obviously clear benefits. But there are other uses of animals, like racing, for example, where there aren't clear benefits, and um, entertainment is the main context as well. So of the three, I think they're all valid. I think the first and third are the, are the most ethical, the most, most obviously based on ethical frameworks that I recognise. And I think the ethical costs and benefits is, is very strong. Um, one of the other... Um items that I was interested in exploring, like if we are separating ethics from morals, it's we've you know, we've decided that it's unethical to have slaves. But just because you feed them and protect them in an environment, that doesn't make it okay. You know, we still agree that slavery is unethical. So that's one of the ways I was trying to separate out the ethics versus welfare. I mean and it is difficult to separate or tease out the, the issues around welfare. So, how robust is the evidence that talks about welfare, as it, um, I guess, as defined in the in the Dorning review that was uh, published? Well, first of all, the, the first argument, this impact and respect for animals, isn't anything to do with welfare. It's to do with dignity and respect for animals, and those are not really to do with welfare. Animal rights groups will talk about welfare, but the fundamental basis of animal rights the animal rights framework is that it's to do with respect, liberty and so on, and welfare is not so important. The utilitarian reasoning requires welfare information to work out what the costs to the animals actually are, so that you can't disentangle welfare there. I've read the Dorning report and I think there has been apparently quite a lot of new evidence since the 2007 Radford report, and there seems to be a more powerful case now that um, there are significant welfare concerns in these animal use contexts. And the report concludes that all five freedoms, the, 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 the five freedoms being a kind of framework of basic of anim, animal welfare rules, are compromised or potentially compromised in these contexts. And they even conclude that they think these animals have a life not worth living, which is a strong statement. I'm not sure there's evidence to support that, but I think there is evidence to support the, the compromise of all five freedoms. Okay. Finlay Carson. I think you've answered the questions on ethical and welfare, but can I ask you what your views are on advantages and disadvantages of, of the Scottish Government's approach to bringing forward this legislation, um, given the, the combination of welfare and, and, and ethics? I think it's a reasonable approach. I think they actually could have played the welfare card more strongly here in the justification. They seem to have gone very much for an ethical, an ethics basis, which, for which there is a basis. Um, I think that may be because, I don't know if this was written before the Doring report was published or there was an overlap in, in those documents appearing. The Doring report, I think, is very well written and very powerful and gives quite a good, strong welfare basis for this bill as well. I think the ethical arguments are important that they're there as well. And I think that when you ask most people in the street, and I think this is some, one of the outcomes of the consultation, they will react morally to this without having a lot of knowledge about the welfare costs and so on. So I think that the... The, the ethical parts are trying to reflect that public opinion and public concern. Can I just ask you for the record, you, you referred to the five freedoms. Yes. Could you outline for the record what those are? Certainly, they're um, a kind of basic checklist for animal welfare developed by the Farm Animal Welfare Council a um, long time ago, but they're now using other animal welfare contexts as well. And they're freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury and disease, freedom to express normal behaviour, and freedom from fear and distress. And the Dorning report outlines the ways in which these may be compromised um, in wild animals and travelling circuses. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Mark Roscoe. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, can I turn some definitions that are within the bill and just get your views on those, please? So, firstly, the definition of a circus. Do you think that's adequately defined within this legislation? Um, I'm not, and I'm not a policy maker, so I, I'm not really sure I know how to comment on that. But I think that they've gone for a kind of norm, you know, commonly understood term, and I think that for the purposes of courts, I think that I think that should be adequate. Mm -hmm. Do you see any potential loopholes within the way that a circus has been defined? I think so, and I think there's concern about these kind of mobile zoo um, issues that there. I know there's, that's meant to be dealt with separately, perhaps, but there are there's definitely overlap there, depending on what your classes of performance. There also, of course, are zoos that have animal performances as well. I know they're not part of this, but ethically, there's not much difference in terms of respect and dignity of the animals involved. Um, so, yeah, I think there, there could be issues with, with blurring of those lines. OK, so I'm mean, just to go in a bit more detail mm. with that. I mean, what, what do you see as the, the particular issues with, say, static performance, um, you know, mobile zoos, um, some of those other other types of animal performance and entertainment that you that you mentioned are, are they are there equivalent ethical and animal welfare issues are there different issues there i think in terms of um static versus traveling circuses i think if the animals are performing tricks or are being used in ways that may be perceived to be disrespectful by some then those issues are the same i think in terms of the welfare compromises of the potential welfare compromises I think it's reasonable to assume that travelling circuses might be worse in this regard because their, their capacity to improve the conditions for the animals is going to be more limited in terms of not being able to provide very large, excellent, long, you know, long-term enclosures for the animals. I think that's been why there's been a target for travelling circuses because they're, they, by their nature, have to be able to move the animals and relocate regularly. Mm -hmm. Do you see the growth in, in other areas then? where animals are used for, for entertainment. I mean, we've, we've had mentioned already the use of reindeer, for example, around Christmas time, shopping centres and things like that. I think it's, it's difficult to generalise. I think it depends on the specific nature of the way the animals are used and how they respond to that. I think also some of the mobile zoos or those kind of um, uses seem to have some educational context, seem to be going into schools and, and showing animals to children. And that, if that's done in a positive way, that could be... That could be part of the utilitarian cost benefit that helps to even the balance between the costs that the animals bear versus the benefits to society. So, again, I think it depends exactly what animals are used and how they're used. It's difficult to generalise. But is there an educational conservation aspect to any of the work of, of circuses that you, you've come across? I think I would agree with the Dawn report that it's what they would say is marginal. I think that um, right. I'm not sure that anyone goes to a circus to be educated. Um, and also, um, the Doring report, and I would also agree, they actually highlight this fact that there's not only, there might be negative aspects to how the animals are perceived by children, for example, that they might see wild animals as pets or wild animals as willing participants in these sort of activities, which may not be actually the case. Mm -hmm. What about the definition of a wild animal within the bill? Is that adequate? Um, I think it is. I think that it's quite a broad definition. Um, any animal that's not domesticated in the British Isles, is that correct? Um, that seems to be very broad to me. Yeah, I um, but I think that I actually quite like that it's broad because I think that because um, people tend to be more concerned about big cats and animals that are large and large charismatic mammals tend to draw the public's interest more, but obviously other animals, uh, small animals and reptiles and birds are equally capable of suffering and equally deserving of protection. So I, I quite like to keep that quite broad. Mm -hmm. And just finally, what, what are your views on the provision within the legislation to allow wild animals to be kept and to travel within Scotland as part of a travelling circus? But, but there's a distinction there between that keeping and a, an actual display and entertainment. I mean, I, I'm not sure I understand yeah. where there's a difference there in terms of animal welfare and ethics. But I think because the bill is primarily saying it's on ethical grounds, and I suppose it's the performing part that they're focusing on there, although the travelling part could still compromise welfare. But I think there's an issue with, if you don't allow people to keep these animals, that's at odds with other legislation that allows a member of the public to keep one of these animals if they wish, as long as they have a licence under the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, if appropriate. So I think they're just trying to avoid that inconsistency. But I agree there are definitely potential welfare issues with animals travelling but not performing. Right, so does this bill adequately capture that? I think it would be helpful to perhaps focus more on the travelling part, that they could be kept at perhaps at one location. That would be more akin to a private owner of these animals. Right. Does that okay. make sense? Mm. Yeah. Good, Lyle.
Yeah, I, it's, can I, first of all, uh, convener, I refer you to my register of interests. I'm the convener of the Showman Skill Cross-Party Group in this Parliament and an honorary member of the Scottish section of the Showman's Guild. Um, basically, um, a question I was asking last week, and, and maybe you, you can touch on it, but, but you may say that it's not within your scope. Uh, definition of a circus. If I had a Wild West show and I had animals um, uh, in that show, would I, be I believe that I would then be not covered by this act. What's your belief? Do you mean using horses instead of wild animals? No. Do you, uh, so a circus sure that we're saying the wild animals in circus bill. My view is if I said um, I have a wild west show but I don't have a circus, what's your definition of a circus? I'm not sure I'm equipped to really answer that. I'm sorry, but um, I think that if it was an event that people were going to in a, in a circus-type format, then I would suspect that... If it was considered by the public to be a circus event, then I would suggest that it would be a circus. Right. And Sunday I att attended a very good show in Blair uh, Drummond Safari Park with seals, etc. Uh, and that's not going to be covered with this act because it's static. Mm -hmm. But basically, what's your definition of a wild animal? If I was a trainer and I'd um, brought up a cub, cubs, and trained them, you know, and, and said, really, they're not wild. What, what's your view? I think that's still a wild animal because it has still got very strong, inherent, and instinctive behavioural, physiological and psychological needs that will have been slightly altered by hand rearing but won't have been removed completely. And these are um, not just down to the environment the animal's in. These are behavioural needs and expressions that are consistent across a species regardless of its rearing. So I think it's still a wild animal. Right. Do you think there's anything, last question, could you, do you think there's anything missing from this bill? No, I'm not, again, I'm not a policy maker, but it seems to be uh, doing what it's supposed to do. Thank you very much. C can I just pick up on that point when you were talking about, uh, Mr Lyle referred to uh, animals that had been reared from cubs. What about if you were getting into fourth, fifth generation of animals that had just been reared through the whole circus system? Would you still hold the same view? I would. Um, I mean, obviously, we have this idea of domestication of animals, and although domestication involves captive breeding and sometimes hand rearing and so on, it isn't just that. It's actually behavioural and, and, and genetic modification of the animal away from its wild progenitor, and that's not going to happen just with rearing, over, you know, generation after generation captivity. So I think that it is still a wild animal. Okay. If you had a blank sheet of paper and was left to design a system to address the concerns about the use of wild animals in circuses, would you have come to roughly this conclusion? In other words, are you content that this is the best way to tackle the issue? I think it is for now, but I do think there's an issue and a gap for these mobile zoos, which are, seems to have very, very close uh, parallels in terms of both the ethical concerns and the welfare issues. So I think that um, I'm sure it's too late now, but some sort of combined approach might have been more efficient. But um, yeah, I think for the specific requirement of this, I think it's it's reasonable. But again, I'm not a policy maker, so that's the, my my best my best understanding of that is that it is. Okay, and and I'm not sure if you're qualified to answer this question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. <laughs> Do you see any potential impact on local economies arising from the legislation? I don't think I'm qualified to comment on that, but there seems to be very few of these circuses visiting Scotland anyway, so um, it obviously would have an impact on the people involved, which is, it has to be considered, but um, no, I don't, I, I don't think I can, I can comment on that. Okay. Do any other members have any other questions for the witness? No? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for your time. That was very useful. Um, we'll suspend briefly for a couple of minutes until we change the witness panel over. Thank you.
Welcome back to the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. We will continue our evidence taking on the Wild Animals and Travelling Circus of Scotland Bill. Uh, from the second of today's panels, we've been joined by David Kerr, Senior Animal Wel Health and Welfare Officer at Argyll and Butte Council, and Andrew Mitchell, the Regulatory Services Manager of the City of Edinburgh Council. Welcome to both of you. Um, Emma Harper. Good morning. Um, I'm interested in the issues around the consultation process for developing the bill. Um, to what extent have you been engaged in the development of this proposed legislation? I certainly think from my purposes, not much. Um, I, I was aware of the evidence of the Scottish Government official last couple of weeks ago. I think COSLA have been involved, but when I checked with the Chief Officer Society for Environmental Health or for Trading Standards, both services likely to be the people who are enforcing this act if it comes into force. Um, they were largely unaware. Um, I'm a little concerned that they were largely unaware because there has been input from local authorities through the <coughs> a Scottish Government Animal Health and Welfare um, Strategy Group. And I know that Helen O'Neill for COSLA responded uh, for. Uh, to brought together the consultations the local authority from those local authorities that did respond to the Scottish Government. So there will have been some feedback from Chief Officers, indirectly possibly through the strategy group. If I could maybe just in terms of, I, that was probably what I would expect. And I think it's merely an indication that the engagement has been at quite a technical level. Uh, if you take the more senior parts of local government who would have to resource this and make policy issues in relation to it, I think the awareness at that level, certainly the level I'm at, is much less in terms of the issue of wild animals and circuses has been out for some time, I think, that, but I certainly would agree that the, any consultation has been at that very technical level. Okay, uh, Richard Lyle. Can you bear with me, convener? Can I tease out, first of all? Um, I was a councillor for 36 years. I found that councils and various authorities interpreted the rules and regulations on everything differently. Um, can I ask, first of all, uh, has your councils banned uh, circuses to be used in, in, in council land? Yeah, I, I think Edinburgh has a position that it historically tried to use the civic government licensing provisions as a way of banning them. Um, they were overturned in the courts in the late 80s, and that court case still stands. Edinburgh then went to position of it will not allow any of its land or property to be leased to anybody who's using any performing animals, whether or not they are wild animals within the definition of this Act. So what that has had a practical effect in Edinburgh is that there are only one or two other sites in the city whereby if you wanted to put on a circus of this type, you would have to approach private landowners as opposed to the council. Do you need to get a licence under the 1982 Act? Uh, not necessarily so. Um, I'm conscious that the spice briefing does refer to Section 41 of the Act, but I would just make the point that those powers are entirely discretionary. If you go back to Section 9 of the Act, it requires local authorities to first of all adopt that and then secondly include circuses or something similar within their resolution, so it's quite possible around the country that different local authorities may not have circuses in their resolution, or could at some point choose to take circuses out of their resolution. Mr Kerr, can I ask if you, Argyll and Butte has banned? Argyll and Butte has taken, historically, has taken very much the same line as Edinburgh has. There was a sort of hiatus after 1996 when Argyll and Butte, some of what had been Dumbartonshire was added, who did not have that policy. And until the policy of the Argyll and Butte Council was realigned, Robert's Circus did operate on private ground, um, not displaying um, wild animals actually performing. Uh, it was non-domestic animals, though they were accompanied by a rather celebrated elephant on, the, on these occasions. Um, as I say, it was just to tease out what your, your current uh, council policy is. Um, my viewpoint is, uh, can this act be circumvented? It says wild animals and circuses bill. But if I, and you likely heard my question earlier to the other witness, uh, if I had a wild west show 
uh, and, and stated that, but had wild animals within it. What would be your view on my application to your council? I think it, it would require a public entertainment licence. I personally think the absence of a definition of a circus in the bill is not helpful. Um, for those of us who might have to enforce it on the ground, um, lack of clarity on what that is will mean that a tremendous amount of time and energy is spent trying to make sure what is presented to us meets the Act. And if it's not clear in the Act, then we would then have to spend tremendous time proving that it's a circus, proving to the Procurator Fiscal it's a circus, and persuading the Procurator Fiscal to take that case. With this Act, as framed at this moment in time, misses a trick? I, I think in that aspect and a couple of other aspects, the Act could be fuller in order to achieve the policy intention. So, again, another example I would give is that I can't imagine enforcing this Act without involving a vet. So the definition of animals which are banned, generally I would expect us to have to engage a vet who could then give evidence to a court, who could satisfy the court that these animals are not normally domesticated in the UK. Yeah. Could be covered in the guidance that accompanies the Act? It perhaps could be if the guidance is a statutory basis. I'm, when I read the Act, there didn't seem to be any reference to guidance under the Act. Okay. Well, what's your definition of a, of a circus? Is a circus, as I remember it, uh, acrobats, horses, lions, tigers, bears, sorry to use that, uh, sounds like one of these shows, um, and, and, and clowns. Uh, is that your def definition of a circus? Certainly, that, that's something that I, I can relate to and would be familiar with. My concern would be that operators might seek to miss out a few of those elements, put them in a different environment, perhaps, not a marquee, and then argue that it's not a circus. And that then would prevent those of us who have to enforce the bill a challenge. I, I could say I'm Joe Bloggs, Wild West Show, and I'll have wild animals but no acrobats. And I, I, what I would say to you, Mr Lyles, I, I, I think your example is a good example of why where it could be grey and would make it difficult. Um, I, I, in terms of the policy intent, that's a matter for the Scottish Government officials. It just strikes me, having read the bill and listened to the evidence so far, it's not... I don't think the bill will be as easy to enforce as perhaps um, suggested. I, I'll finish off, convener, on the, this... Uh, Mr Kerr, you've heard the Edinburgh District, uh, uh, Council's view. What is Argyll and Butte's view? Similar? I, I share a lot of the same concerns. Definition, um, you know, all the legislation I work under is criminal law, Animal Health and Welfare Act, Animal Health Act. Definition is crucial. Anything that blurs it brings some element of reasonable doubt, or if you've got a good defence, maybe not particularly reasonable doubt. It does bring that into it. For us to enforce effectively, we do need clear definitions to help us because the reality is that in the event, on, on current business practices, it's very unlikely we're going to be confronted with this, with an actual circus coming in and trying to confront it. I think it, it appears to me much more likely that there will be issues over people who may be trying to circumvent it or indeed issues where other operations which are similar to a circus may, come, may be reported to us. I, we really could do with very clear definition as much as we can. I, I, I think when you, um, Mr Lyle referred to the idea of having a sort of travelling show with non, animals not normally domesticated, I think that would probably be covered by your definitions, but I absolutely agree with my colleague. We would have to have veterinary input. And that's, uh, I would support some of Dr McKeegan's views that all the legislation I enforce currently is science-based. And that, in some ways, is easier to deal with than something that's ethics-based, because if there's an issue about a zoo licence, I can go to very specialist, skilled, highly respected veterinary surgeons who can support me in what I'm doing. When we come to an ethical basis, I think this could be very profitable for the defence. <laughs> You know, I, 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 clear definition is what we need when we're enforcing, because you, 
you talk, we, we tend to talk, oh, it's common sense. It's obvious. And that is true. But in a court of law, you have to define. You have to define to the nth degree. And you can be, it can take a lot of time to define. Now, if you have great complexity in forcing legislation, then the Procurator Fiscal Service will be looking askance at, the, uh, at taking the cases as well, because they're very, very intelligent and very well-educated men and women. They don't want to embark in prosecutions that are likely to fail. So, the, the, ladies and gentlemen, the better you can define the legislation, the better you can define the subject of it, the easier it will be to enforce effectively. Can I thank you both gentlemen for confirming what I originally thought? This uh, has to be defined better. Thank you. Uh, Finlay Carson. Yeah, yeah, on the back of that, I think, for the record, you, you're both confirming that the definition of a circus and also the definition of a wild animal could, could cause problems uh, in the bill as it, it currently stands. Can I ask you, how, how do you currently cope with uh, events, for example, that maybe take part within a, an agricultural show, so uh, wild birds, so we, we see the, the falcon displays or whatever, or, or possibly uh, the llama show where... There's, there's llamas arrive in, in, the, in the show ground and they're jumping hurdles and going round hoops and carrying things. How, how does the council cope with uh, events like that that are not maybe strictly defined as a travelling circus? Public entertainment licence is how that's dealt with primarily, usually by the environmental health side of the, of the business. Though I, I can exactly see where you're going, sir, because this is the type of... Uh, if this legislation is not pinned down very well, we can see perhaps people who have strong interests in animal rights making an illusion between this legislation into something like that. So that's going to have to be defined, unless, of course, the, the, the Scottish Government decides in due course that these should be dealt with in the same way. But that, you're absolutely right. There, there is a blurring of edges there. I believe when I, I read some of the preliminary papers that this was Andrew Vos um, um, for the um, veterinary side of it, uh, did make it very clear that he felt that this should be different. There should be clear differentiation that this legislation did not cover that type of show. But how you do it precisely in law, your draftsman will have a very busy time. So just following on from that, in, in your view, are there things which are in this bill which shouldn't be in? And are, th are there things which are being left out of, of the bill in terms of its scope which you think should be in the bill? Um, I think I share my colleague's concern that at the margins local authorities will come under quite intense pressure from groups who have concerns about this whole area and will seek to blur the lines and push local authorities into using the Act to get into areas where perhaps Parliament hadn't intended. Um, the second point I suppose I would make is the enforcement powers are not probably the greatest. So, in reality, if a travelling circus turns up, we can investigate and we can report to the Procurator Fiscal, but there is nothing to stop the, arc the circus continuing to operate in the meantime. Um, so, things like fixed penalty notices, the power to require it to stop, are missing from the bill in that kind of a... And then, the example I think somebody gave of zoos displaying um, we can quite clearly see things that look like that where there will be an argument of whether or not the bill goes as far as to cover that kind of thing. So uh, my personal view would be that if you're going to regulate this area, it would be helpful to do it in its entirety and not just one aspect. It would be very useful to have common definitions across dangerous wild animals, zoo licensing and circuses it would assist the local authorities because we're the enforcing bodies all the time. And it, it is unfortunate that when people have strongly held passionate views or a tendency to wish to evade the law, they look for the margins, they look for the confusion, and they look for the blurring to to get a handhold. I mean, the government has committed, though, to consulting on those wider forms of animal entertainment. Um, you're not confident in that process? Or? Contribute to the best of their abilities, but we look, because we have got this proposed legislation, which is uh, sort of standing almost in isolation with blurred edges around it as we perceive it. Well, for instance, it's not a statutory duty for the local authority to enforce it in its current form. Is that correct? I believe. Um, you know that that's something that has to take into account, particularly when local authorities 
are very, very short of resources, very short of skilled specialist manpower, you know, and you're not going to be putting, uh, a, a, well, you'd be very cruel to put a new recruit into the job of trying to take action against a travelling circus, let's put it that way. Mm. Okay, in terms of, I think, if you go through, you would have the Act, failing the Act, the public entertainment system, if it's there. If not, then you're reliant on the Performing Animals Act, I think, of 1925. And if you're talking about a coherent approach, it's worth bearing in mind that that act has been scheduled to be repealed for the last 10 years and is still sitting on the statute book, antiquated and out of date. OK, and just returning to the, the definition issues around circus and wild animals, um, there is a proposed definition that comes from the Oxford English Dictionary and there's other definitions that exist in uh, other, other acts from the 70s and I think the 1925 act as well. Wh which definition would you like to see in this bill for clarity? It's not for me to decide, but I, what I want is something or what... and. Perhaps I should uh, demonstrate another of the hats. I'm also chairman of the Scottish Animal Health and Welfare Panel, so uh, I represent, and represent the ground troops in animal health and welfare and local authority. We need to have something that is clearly undefined. So we know on one side of it that's a circus, on one side of it it's not. It's down to um, more knowledgeable and um, legally trained minds than ours to make that definition. But I, I would assure everybody here present, if it is blurred, then the enforcement will be very shaky and blurred as well. And that's not what anybody else want. I mean, the, the comment from the Scottish Government official that we had last week was, um, uh, they said that we're not expecting people to overthink the definition of a circus. I, I would agree with that, uh, and that's a very fine aspiration. But I'm reminded of a, a comment from uh, uh, Lord M Colin Mackay, who is now Lord Mackay, who is Sheriff in Oban, and a very elaborate and flamboyant defence had been put up to him. He said, well, very interesting, let us see what the law says. <laughs> and that is what ultimately we deal with what the law says, not intentions, not what people want to happen. If you want something to happen, you have to write it in precisely. And then we, can, we on the ground will, will carry out your wishes. But intentions of what you hope will happen is not what happens in a court of law. I've been in enough of them. <laughs> I'm also not entirely clear, I understand your point about wild animals. I mean, is it not clear what a wild animal is because of its species? In which case, why would you need a vet to, to step in and help with the definition of that? I mean, it, it either is a domesticated species or it isn't. <coughs> Unless, of course, you accept the argument that over multi-generations it could become domesticated in some way. I, I wouldn't dispute uh, Dr McKeegan's expert uh, witness on that for a minute. But what I would say is when I started out shepherding in the Chivet Hills far too long, many decades ago, what you had on farms were cattle, sheep, pigs and poultry and horses. Now you may well have camelids, you may have ostriches. There are even, I believe, crocodile farms in the south. This is a de it's an elastic definition because what is normally domesticated can change. If you were to put that observation, in the extreme case, into the Far East, you have Chinese medicine um, tiger farms. So that the definition needs to be thought out because what we have on farms nowadays is changed out of all recognition to what happened even when I was a hurdle years ago. Okay. If we agree that this is a goal that we want to achieve, what's the best way to achieve it? Is it um, taking the bill as it's proposed and perhaps amending it, addressing some of your concerns with guidance, whatever, or is there a different approach that could be taken to get where we want to go? My personal belief is that I think Dr McKeegan pointed the way. The Dorian report is very good, and I think the emphasis should be heavily on the welfare, because as soon as you have welfare as a, as a basis for it, you draw in that very effective piece of legislation, the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006, and that gives you a, a totally different support. I, I believe that the, well, the, the, the choice to use ethical um, reasoning is perfectly understandable, and indeed Dr McKeegan made a very sound defence of it. But welfare is so much easier for us to prove with skilled veterinary assistance. And if I were drafting this legislation, I would be, I'd be leaning on the welfare side of it. I think that's much more to the point. And she's absolutely right, the five freedoms underpins all animal health and welfare legislation in the UK. And 
and it's been taken on very, very strongly by the Scottish Parliament. Um, so we, we have a good grounding for that. I think um, I would disagree from what a colleague said. To sort of raising up a particular level, I would say from a local government's perspective, having a piecemeal approach to this whole area is not helpful. I think if the Scottish Government are intent on improving across the piece how we deal with performing animals in terms of regulating or banning, then it should be done as one item, one piece of legislation. Um, as to me, it's certainly not helpful to have some dealt with by a a relatively modern piece of legislation, and then if you don't fit in that definition, you're falling back in the Performing Animals Act, which is well past its useful purpose. So I, I would, that would be my suggestion in terms of if this is the aim that you're looking for to look at this whole area, then it should be looking at this whole area in its entirety. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Okay, um, thanks, Convener. We know that uh, Schedule 1 makes provision for local authorities or Scottish ministers to appoint inspectors uh, for the purpose of enforcing the legislation. Um, and the local authority inspectors clearly ultimately have uh, accountability to their own local authority. Now, you, you've mentioned some aspects where the proposed legislation is lacking and would be, uh, to quote Mr Kerr, blurred and shaky. So. Um, for, for the record, do you have any further views or concerns with regard to the proposed uh, enforcement approach? Um, if I can maybe start in terms of the definition of an operator seems to me to be quite remote from the reality. So looking at a definition that says someday in day-to-day -day control of what appears to be a circus as being liable, I think would be helpful. In relation to some of the powers, the powers generally speaking in the legislation, are quite different from what most environmental health and trading standards powers are. Principally, the need to go and obtain a warrant. Um, I know the bill does say that if you have, that's not reasonable, then you can carry on as is, but other legislation doesn't have that caveat. And specifically, what I would be interested in is the power to obtain records because in terms of proving an offence and enforcing the Act, that's probably one of our most important tools um, in terms of asking for records from the operator to prove what animals they have, where they've come from, what the business is, and the fact that you would normally have to go and seek a warrant would make enforcement more difficult in that particular regard. So I, I would urge that the committee look at moving that power, at, like other powers that officers have, into the if you have reasonable cause to suspect or believe an offence, you can use that power. Um, and lastly, I just make, again make the point, there is no immediate power to stop these events happening, even if we do detect an offence. An offence, So it, it is entirely possible that we could come along, investigate, report the matter to the fiscal, and the circus would continue to operate. OK, Mr Kerr, you have anything to add? Yeah, I think I uh, absolutely support those, those remarks. Uh, I think we should perhaps be looking at a full suite of enforcement powers. It's something that we've been working towards in relation to other animal welfare legislation. FBNs, fixed penalty notices, is a possibility, but also the power to serve notice. And that buys you time, and it's a very effective way. Environmental health use it very routinely for dealing with whether there's a hazard that we think is ongoing or anything like that. Serve notice, and it simplifies the legal procedure. If somebody breaches the notice, that's the offence, which means that the burden of proof is much more clearly defined for you. And it would also allow us to act proactively to prevent somebody committing the offence. If, if, if somebody reported a circus in your area which had wild animals in it and was travelling, and there was a possibility they were performing, you could go to the, go to the say, this is not happening. You can carry on the rest of your business, but you're not doing that now. The circus can challenge that in a court. You have actually taken action to stop what clearly all the people who contributed to this legislation felt is something that is wrong. You know, that would, and at the same time, you can actually stop criminalising people in a way. It's a, it's a graded enforcement approach. If somebody has slipped up, which is possible, people could innocently think they are not breaching this legislation. You become aware of them operating, you serve notice, and they say, oh, wait a minute, OK. I'm going to comply. If, you, if our only, uh, as it stands, as my colleague was saying, our only recourse is to take this to court. Now, 
I don't know if any of you have been involved in any court cases recently. The courts are very, very heavily clogged up. It's not a quick process. You know, the, if the circus was not based in the UK, the circus could have completed its entire round and gone back to, to mainland Europe um, before you got anywhere near a court. How could you unwittingly breach this legislation? I mean, it would be pretty obvious what you were doing, wouldn't it? I would... We may think so, but then perhaps we have a circus operator who is not from the UK. But there's linguistic problems, there's a failure to understand. There, there are, I, I, I can't speculate as to why... It, it, again, when you deal with science and law, it's best to prove that something is wrong or can be wrong. I can't double-guess what's in somebody's mind. I can see by their actions. It's not my business to do so either as an enforcer. So I, I would agree with you that if an established uh, UK-based circus um, arrived with animals which were going to perform, you would have to be very doubtful about the uh, innocence of the person who had done that. But we, everyone's innocent until they're proved guilty. Yes, but I think the, the idea that someone would bring a circus from elsewhere in Europe here when they were aware that we had legislation of this type and unwittingly breach it does seem a bit unlikely, does it? It not? seems unlikely, but then I've met a lot of unlikely things in my time. OK. <laughs> uh, OK. Assuming that a, a fixed penalty uh, is introduced when, when the Act comes into force, there's also um, the provision in Schedule 1 for uh, someone that commits an offence under Section 1 to be liable to maximum fine not exceeding uh, Level 5, which is currently £5,000. Uh, have you any views on that maximum fine level? I think it's appropriate to the equivalent legislation, wouldn't you say, Andrew? It's certainly similar. However, I would make the point that if you have a large tent, 500 people, £10 a ticket, um, you're already made that in terms of costs. So I, I think the economics of operating these kind of things, you could quite quickly, I think, generate more income than the fine. Okay. Fine increased. I think, I think my, my, my preference probably would be that my colleague is to see some power to stop it going ahead, as opposed to, I think the criminal courts sh should really be the last resort, so my preference would be that. <coughs> then there could be, it could be deemed that there's more than one operator in that particular uh, uh, travelling circus. Um, You've touched on this earlier, but clearly there are resource implications for uh, local authorities uh, enforcing the legislation. Um, for example, you've already mentioned the possibility that you, you may need to engage a, a, a vet. Do, do you have any concerns about the overall resource implications? I think I would, um, I suppose, just make some general points. Um, I can't, as I say, imagine enforcing this act without involving a vet giving evidence. It comes in a context of local authorities and diminishing resources. I entirely agree with my colleague that there is no statutory duty to enforce the Act on local authorities, so it becomes discretionary. So each local authority would have to balance existing resources and this new duty. So give a practical example, for my teams in environmental health and trading standards, I would probably have to take somebody away from food health and safety or consumer protection in order to investigate any case that may come up because there is no new resources that come with this particular bill. Okay, and presumably a similar situation in Argyll and Butte? I think that would be true. I mean, on the face of it and the evidence that I has been presented to us uh, in the course of developing this legislation, it's very, very unlikely that we're going to be dealing with a conventional circus because as I don't think such travelling circuses have been visiting Scotland over the last two years, is that correct? And possibly more. Um, I think we're, we're more likely to get the problems of some, something that is deemed to be circus-like becoming the subject of this legislation and that would be, that would be consuming a resource and time, significantly so. OK, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, gentlemen, thank you uh, very much for your time this morning. That's certainly brought a perspective to it, to the, the um, deliberations that we're having. Um, if we have any further questions, we'll write to you in due course. Thank you very much for your time again. I'm going to suspend now, um, and we will take account of the minute's silence during that suspension. Okay, thank you.
Welcome back to the Environment, Climate Change and the Land Reform Committee. We will now hear evidence from our third panel on the Wild Animals and Travelling Circus of Scotland Bill. Uh, we are joined today by Anthony Beckwith, the proprietor of An Evening with Lions and Tigers, Rona Brown, the Government Liaison Officer for the Circus Guild of Great Britain, on behalf of Pe Peter Jolly Circus and the European Circus Association, Martin Burton, the Chairman of the Association of Circus Proprietors of Great Britain, and Carol McManus, an animal trainer with Circus Mundeo. Good morning to you all. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Emma Harper's question. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to talk again about the consultation that you heard, and we had um, lots of evidence was submitted. And uh, But since the Scottish Government's consultation, the Welsh Government published a study from which is called the Dorning Review. And I'll sum it up quite quickly. It says the available scientific evidence indicates that captive wild animals and circuses and other travelling animal shows do not achieve their optimal welfare requirements and set out, that's set out in the Animal Welfare Act 2006. And the evidence would therefore support a ban on using wild animals in travelling circuses and mobile zoos on animal welfare grounds. So I'm wondering what the panel's views are on the rationale that the Scottish Government have set out for the banning of the use of the wild animals, banning it based on ethical rather than welfare issues. And what would your views be on um, the purpose and the policy objectives of the bill? Indicate. Anthony Beckwith. Yeah, um, my issue is, is the... The scientific data that's available that's involved first-hand studies of circus animals has actually come out um, to the contrary of that and it shows that the circuses can and do provide a level of welfare that's equal to any other captive environment and in some cases better in the case of sort of stress and anxiety levels tend to be lower in circus animals due to the additional mental stimuli that's available to them and the, them studies that go back the past 30 years, the most recent one in 2011, and the, the earliest one in the late 1980s, and they've all been quite consistent with, with their results, and these actually involve first-hand studies, including scientific data collected, cortisol tests to test stress levels on animals, animals monitored in travelling, training, um, and they've been done across Europe, here in the UK and in America, and all the results come back consistent with the fact that the circus welfare does not, it, the welfare in circus is not compromised. You don't have to answer every question. You don't feel you have a, a locus in any of them. But uh, Rona Brown. Excuse me, could I? I was just going to ask you if you could indulge me and turn the sound up a bit, please. Absolutely. We've had a difficulty with that this morning. If we could turn the sound up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Or if not, I'll speak a bit louder, I th please. I think it's for the benefit of all of us, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, uh, do, you wish, do you wish to come in and comment on, in response to that question? Yes, I'm, I'm concerned about what you now call the Dawning Report, because it is actually the Harris et al. report, which was dismissed by the British um, government as being just a collection of other people's views back in 2014. He then put it together again, Professor Harris and Joe Dawning and the other lady whose name I forget, um, and brought it out again, and is now trolling it all over Europe for the circuses. And it has no more impact than it did back in 2014. And in fact, it, a, a lot of the stuff that's been quoted as to why you're bringing in on the subject of ethics is because everybody else has exhausted the animal welfare issue and gone through it and can't prove one way or the other. There's been hiccups. Let's not, let's not beat about the bush. There are hiccups. There have been hiccups with animals in circuses. But the current view of most people, scientists, is, and also, I have to say, of the English government, is that there are no welfare issues in wild animals in the circuses in the UK as they stand now, not as they stood 50 years ago, not as they stood 20 years ago, but now. So it, to me, I find it unethical, if you like, to use things like the Harris Report, to use things 
that other people say the welfare is wrong, the ethics are wrong. I bet not one of you around this table has ever been to the two circuses that are licensed to see for yourself. Neither is Professor Harris or Joe Dorning. They just don't want to see the truth. The, the, it's with respect, these are views. They've expressed views, you're expressing a view. That's the issue, the problem here. These are opinions. We have to try and get through beyond the opinions and look at the, the facts and as far as we can ascertain them. Anthony Beckwith, do you want to just, come back? Yeah, just to add to that, please. Um, the Professor Harris report was actually a literature review, so it's a scientific opinion of other people's studies, and it's a scientific opinion of the studies that I've made reference to previously. And authors of the original studies have joined me in launching a complaint against Professor Harris with the Bristol University for research misconduct because um, Professor Ted Friend, namely, of the Texas University, because he personally believes that his work was misrepresented by Professor Harris. And Professor Harris, in other areas aside from circus, has presented some complications with animal welfare issues. Due, he was the impartial witness in fox hunting cases. Unfortunately, legal action was taken against him, and he was proven not to be impartial, but to be affiliated with animal rights groups, which is the fundamental difference between animal welfare and animal rights, and therefore he's no longer considered an impartial witness in fox hunting or other hunting cases. Obviously, people have opinions about that particular review, but that's not really what we're looking at today, and I need to move this on and focus on what we are here for uh, today. Um, does anybody else want to come in on the original question? Could you repeat the original question, please? Uh, essentially, my colleague um, was asking for your views on the rationale that the Scottish Government has set out for banning the use of wild animals in travelling circuses in Scotland. No? No? Okay. Come in very briefly. Absolutely. You know. um, just to come back to, um, Rona Brown, to your... Um, comment if I, if I picked it up right that um, uh, you said the current view on welfare issues in circuses is, is, is different to that of those that were highlighted in, in, the, in, the, in the evidence. Could, could you point us in the direction of what those current views are briefly and, and so we can take a, a, a careful look at them? Sure. sure. Excuse me. <clears throat> And uh, the, the main evidence of good animal welfare in travelling circuses, the witnesses are the vets in, that belong to DEFRA. The four vets that are the inspectors are independent vets. They inspect the licensed animals, circuses rather, uh, three times a year. The licensed circuses also have to have four other inspections by their own lead vet, and if he can't do it, he has to nominate somebody else to do it. And all of those reports are the evidence that there is not a problem. Yes, there are hiccups, there are bits and pieces. You know, the, the, the circuses get accused, the jollies in particular get accused that their Ancoli cow died. It was 32 years old. Out, long outlived zoo Ancolis, but it was put against saying it died because of bad welfare. It's just not fair and not true. Right, thank you. That's helpful just to clarify that point. Okay, thank you. Richard Lyle. Yes, good morning. Again, can I refer, just in case anyone missed it, can I refer people to my register of interest? I am the cross party chairman of the Showman's Guild and an honorary member of the Showman's Guild Scotland section. I also was previously, and you may have uh, listened to my question of the, the council was a councillor for 36 years and found that the council sometimes misinterpreted the bill or an act or whatever. Do you have any views on the scope of the bill? Does it cover uh, what, it, what it covers and what, is it, what, what it doesn't cover? And does the bill make sense to you? Uh, my first question would be to Mr Beckwith, because I know that you have said that basically you think your animals are not covered under the bill. Exactly. Under the definition that's been set out in the bill, my show is in the circus. Um, what is your show? It's called An Evening with Lions and Tigers, and it's a travelling educational animal training display um, featuring lions and tigers. Um, 
we there's no clowns, acrobats, trapeze artists, ringmasters, flashing lights. It's zoos type safari dressed outfits in a jungle themed inside a tent where we talk on welfare, conservation, and we do train displays with the big cats and we talk about the methods used in training for film, TV and circus. Uh, then we do question and answers at the end. But it does travel around in a big top with big cats. But there's no circus involved. Yeah, you, that you may be in the process of applying for a circus licence in England. Well, if that was the case, would that not bring you within the scope of the bill then? If, if, you, if you were successful in, in securing that licence? But the definition is a bit different in this bill than it is in the... In the DEFRA bill, and also we did have some confusion whether we would need a licence or not with DEFRA, and we couldn't get an answer, and then we opted to go with it, because there is no other regulation, because we operate the similar to a, a travelling reptile show, or a travelling bird of prey show, and if you have a bird of prey or a reptile in the circus, it's covered under the circus licensing, but if you have it as a standalone show, it's not covered under anything. And due to the sensitivity and being the only people to travel the UK with big cats at present, uh, we volunteered to opt into the, the licensing system because it creates transparency, it gives us a level of credibility. So, But you get my point, that if you do secure a circus licence in England, there is a, certainly an interpretation that says you would fall within the scope of the bill. There is, but again, it's open to, it's suggestive and open to interpretation. Um, the definition that's out in the bill and, and by Andrew Voss when we spoke to him was the Oxford English Dictionary, which is a variety performance featuring acrobats, clowns and animals, which isn't by any means what our show is all. There's none of that. There's no variety. It is purely big cats in an animal training display, same as the sea lion show at the zoo or a, or a bird of prey show, but with big cats. I just wanted to explore. I'll, I'll let everyone back to answer Mr Lyle's original question. But basically you were saying, you were saying your submission that you... Um, the definition constitutes the travel and circus by definition sent, set out by Andrew Vos, Scottish Government's veterinary advisor. Your show does not fall under the definition of a travel, travelling circus, and you're suggesting that he was unable to clarify if your show would even be banned under this legislation, and you might be able to tour Scotland with big cats freely. Uh, I asked him to clarify, uh, given the definition of what my show was and explained, and asked if it would be covered, and he responded, I don't know. Sorry, he responded what? I don't know. I don't know? Yes. OK. Um, can I ask um, Rona Brown and for possibly Martin Burton, um, when was the last uh, a, a travelling circus in Scotland with wild animals? That's the problem. There hasn't been a travelling circus in Scotland for a very long time. And it begs the question, why are you bothering doing this? There isn't a travelling circus. The circuses that come to Scotland are, are fa fairly well known. Um, the same group of circuses come to Scotland in the summer months every year. None of them include wild animals. Yeah, because I, I've seen notices, uh, travelling circuses in Edinburgh, uh, I have within my constituency Hamilton Racecourse. I know that a circus has been there. So, but there's never, the, the no wild, uh, as we know, uh, as I remember I travelled the circus when I was younger. Uh, uh, you had... There are no circuses with wild animals that have visited Scotland in recent times. Right, so, uh, uh, and, and Rona Brown's correct. I haven't been at one recently, Rona, I do apologise. <laughs> But, you know, so the circuses that are now coming to Scotland, what, what do they have in them? Acrobats, clowns, a bit of laugh, a bit of fun? Uh, Zippo Circus has horses, birds, sometimes dogs. Uh, last year, domestic cats, all domestic animals. There are no wild animals in circuses that have visited Scotland in recent times. A question I didn't get to ask our, our council authorities, and I'll finish on this convener. Would you class a llama or a reindeer as a wild animal? Uh, that's not for me to answer. A llama is domesticated. It what has been, it? I think, since 2009, if I'm correct, or 2007. What about a reindeer? Um, some reindeers are domesticated and some aren't, and that is very vague in the... Dangerous Wild Animal Act. So, so if I turned up, and I'll finish in this, 
if I turned up at a, a shopping centre or a local um, summer fete or a show with uh, a couple of reindeer, or you turned up, sorry, with uh, reindeers, do you think that would be covered under this bill and you may be breaking the law? I don't know. Um, with the uh, regulations in England, the circuses have reindeer, both circuses have reindeer, and they are licensed to work on the circus. However, during the winter months, they work as Father Christmas's reindeer in places all around their hometown, and they go. The situation we have there is that we inform DEFRA where they're going to go, how long they're going to be there, how long they're going to stay there, what the transport is, who the vet is, everything. And DEFRA come back and say, OK. And then when the animals are safely back on the circus's home ground, we tell DEFRA that they're home again. And this is how it works in England, because DEFRA, quite rightly, didn't want to kill Father Christmas. Yeah, but can I point out, sorry, Convena, the laws in England that cover um, showmen, show, show guilds, whatever, are different in Scotland. We have the 1982 Act, which you don't have in England, <coughs> which covers, um, you know, uh, thing. am I correct in saying that? Yes. Thank you. And, uh, but the, the thing, the thing the, why I was telling you that was, I personally feel, um, and uh, Jolly Circus and also the European Circus Association feel, that there should be provision in your Scottish Bill for this to happen. That people can, circus people can take their reindeer in Scotland if you in, are intent and go for it, health for leather and ban, that circus people should be able to take their reindeer out at Christmas time. Thank you, Kevin. Can I just be clear, Martin Burton, you, you've t you said that the two circuses currently based in England don't have wild animals. A, are there any, is there any indicate, sorry. I, I, I didn't say two circuses based in England. There are two circuses so, that do have wild animals. But they don't come to Scotland. But they don't come, come to Scotland. Scotland. So let me clarify that then. Um, are you aware of any plans to introduce additional circuses which might come to Scotland? And are there any uh, examples of circuses based in mainland Europe who potentially could come to Scotland with wild animals? I'm not aware of any circuses in Great Britain who intend to come to Scotland with wild animals. Um, certainly none of the members of the Association of Circus Proprietors intend to come to Scotland with wild animals. I'm not aware of any circuses from mainland Europe who would come to Britain at all with any form of animal, wild or domestic. OK, that's fine. <coughs> Clarification on that. Fin Sorry, Rona Brown. Um, the two circuses that are licensed in England would very much like to come to Scotland. However, they have mostly hoof stock and the distance travelling from their hometowns to Scotland is really more than they are prepared to put their animals through because the, 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 the way they travel, with Jolly Circus in particular, since they went out after Christmas, the furthest they've travelled is 27 miles. They hop 10 miles, 5 miles, 21 miles. And to go to Scotland would mean overnights and stopping and getting a vet when you're there, finding out. And then they have to go through all the regulations of applying for a licence up there as well, up here as well, sorry. And so this is really why Jolly Circus doesn't come to Scotland, but would very much like to. OK. Philip Carson. Thanks. Um, it, it, I think it's a question uh, for Carol. Uh, it's, it's about it's round to the definition of a wild, wild animal. Do you believe it's the, the definition is open to a challenge in the way it's interpreted, uh, given the changes in behaviour, life cycle, and that some animals would undergo uh, to become domesticated because of their role within a circus? 
two of the animals that I've got licensed are actually in their own countries domesticated. There's only a zebra that would come under not being domesticated, and my past zebra's probably more domesticated than the free-range cockerel that we have on the circus that will attack you. And both my zebras were as sweet as anything, wander around free, anybody could pet them, never showed any malice, never kicked bit in the whole of their lifetime. One lived to 32, one lived to 26 years of age. So what is domesticated and what is wild? Because I think my cockerel's more wild than actually my zebras are. And I was on the website last night, both dromedary and bactrian camels, it comes up as domesticated. So, so just for the record, would, do you, are you suggesting, or do you believe that there, there would be potential legal challenge to the definition of wild animal, uh, because it, it, yes. even with this bill? I may be able to help a little bit with a bit of clarification on this, because there seems to be a lot of confu confusion over what's wild and what isn't. But actually, if you look at it from a taxonomy perspective, which is the scientific classification of all living things, and that doesn't change globally. Every animal falls into a category, and we, however we perceive it, that category doesn't change. And like Carol said there, some camels are actually domesticated. There's actually three... You have to look at the Latin names of the animals. There's three different species of camel. Two of them are completely domesticated. Completely. Um, then you've also got the, the there's four cat classifications: wild, domesticated, semi-domesticated, and feral. And every species falls into one of those categories. And a species of Asian and Indian elephant also fall into the semi-domesticated category, not wild. Um, but an African elephant is completely wild. And, and with the camels, Cam Camulus dromedrus is domesticated, but Camulus ferus is is wild. And they are different species, and they fall into a category and. People might perceive them as wild in different countries or use them as wild or domesticated, but they are globally, scientifically, either wild, domesticated, feral, or semi-domesticated, and that, that can't change. And if you come down to what would be a legal definition, I think in a court of law, they'd, they'd probably go to the taxonomy and whether that species is domesticated or not, whether it's perceived as domesticated. And to give an example, some animals that are perceived as wild in this country um, but in fact are domesticated is zebu, water buffalo, yak, camels, um, and then the semi-domesticated is the elephants, rhea, bison, and emu. So I think that if we're going to look at what's wild and what's domesticated, we should look at the taxonomy of it rather than what people think or, or believe is domesticated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Um, and good, good morning still to everybody. Um, could I ask you, um, I appreciate that, that you've expressed a concern about the ban per se, but could I ask you um, if anyone on the panel has any suggestions um, about alternative approaches that could enable the issues the Scottish Government is seeking to address to be tackled effectively? If, if I may. Um, the interesting thing about Scotland, and, and as a man who operates circuses, with domestic animals in Scotland. Um, I, I can tell you, you already have the most robust regulatory regime uh, anywhere in the UK. Uh, your public entertainment licensing is not mirrored in England or Wales. Uh, your public entertainment licensing ensures very firmly the welfare of the domestic animals that I bring here, as well as the equipment that the public will use, the seats, the tents, the infrastructure. Uh, so yet again, I, I, I'm surprised, given that Scotland, in many respects through your public entertainment licensing system, is ahead of the rest of the UK, why you, why you feel the need uh, to step into an area which I think a number of your witnesses have already told you are full of traps. Where, where will this end? Will this end with um, no more displays in zoos? Will this end with no more displays at agricultural shows? Will this end with no more falconry displays? Will this end with no more ownership of animals. You mentioned earlier a 
about slavery and emancipation. And of course, we all understand that there was a t time in the history of the world when certain people were enslaved and needed to be emancipated. The question is, do animals require the same emancipation? What, what you must think about and what you must decide is, are we emancipating an animal because we are giving an animal the same rights as a human being? Or do we take the view that man has dominion over the animals and that the animals are there for us to care for, but not necessarily enshrine in rights? And this brings us to the fundamental issue of animal welfare versus animal rights. As I understand the animal rights argument, an animal can suffer, an animal should not be kept in a field, in a house, should not be owned so it can walk across the road and get run down, but it is free. I myself am an animal welfareist, so I think an animal should be protected from traffic on a road should be protected from abuse. And that means that protection may mean I have to keep it in a corral, in a paddock, in a stable, and it's not free. So that the whole question, the whole question is, are you enshrining animals with some emancipation that gives them freedom but takes away from them the welfare that I believe is our duty to give to animals. Thank you, that, that's a, a, a helpful contribution. Could I ask you specifically in relation to the travelling aspect of, of this issue, if you have any comment on that? Now I'll come to other, other uh, uh, Rona can give you the better evidence than I, but there is uh, no evidence that animals suffer stress while travelling any in the circus any more than anywhere else. Um, I, I, I'll tell you what we do with our horses. Our horse, uh, just like the other circuses with animals, we, we don't travel vast distances. We, we try to keep the travel times less than eight hours. Uh, the horses will be um, last thing loaded, first thing off the field, first thing unloaded, fed and watered. Uh, and they've had heart rate monitors while they're travelling and there's clearly no stress. Um, we've observed them when we load and unload them. There is no stress. There is no difference between moving a horse um, around Scotland than there is moving a horse around from one racetrack to another. Right, thank you. And could I just, for clarification, ask you, Mr Burton, about the, what you see as the differences between the public entertainment licences for Scotland, which you've highlighted as being more rigorous than those for um, England? And there isn't one in England. Right. That's the difference. But I thought there was a UK-wide licensing system. Ah, that's, that's completely different. Right, well, for, for the record and for the health so, committee, could you clarify that then, please? So the public entertainment licensing in Scotland um, reg regulates every aspect of me bringing a circus to Scotland. There is a licensing system for wild animals in England, um, which I am not part of, but Carol, I'm sure, can tell you more about because she is. Um, which, enable, which ensures that the animals are well cared for and the evidence is clear for all to see from constant veterinary checks uh, and, and reporting back that the animals are, are always in good condition. And uh, uh, Carol McManus, I don't know if you've got comment on that and also on... Um if you or other members of the panel have comment on alternatives um, to the legislation, as was the initial question. Thank you. This is just all my checks from DEFRA since we started the licensing, which started in 2013. It's 
the vet inspection reports. Um, we get spot checks. We have four veterinary inspections a year by local veterinary officers or lead veterinary inspectors. We get three inspections a year that are veterinary officers that are dedicate, allocated from DEFRA and that work for DEFRA. Um, this is only one of the folders. Each animal has its own folder. Plus we have to do when we travel them, when we don't travel them. We need to keep a check on absolutely everything. How much water, hay. The only thing that has changed is the paperwork because we were doing it all before anyway. Just to, yeah. Can, can I just pick up on, on, on something? In, in your written evidence, Mr. Beckwith, and I quote, you said that every single manoeuvre or trick, in inverted commas, action by our animals is a completely natural movement that their distant wild cousins would carry out. But I would put it to you that sitting on a stool following commands from a human being is not what a wild animal would naturally and instinctively do. But that, that's the instruction, not the action. The action of actually sitting up is a, a complete natural manoeuvre. Nothing is unnatural about that. Because a lot of the arguments against it is the tricks are unnatural, therefore can have a physical harm to the animals. But every action that they do, run, jump, lying down, rolling over, sitting up, are all natural behaviours that would be imitated in, in the wild. It's just teaching that action on, on command um, that, that's different. The action is still natural. Mm. Could it, be else? Uh, it was just if there were um, from the, the, the two other panel members, Mr Beckwith and Ms Brown, if there were any issues that you wanted to highlight in terms of an alternative that would be effective. I appreciate that you're arguing that there shouldn't be a ban, but if there were other comments. Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously the, a lot of the ethical concerns raised are actually welfare concerns and the, the, the science and the evidence from Westminster show that the licensing system does protect the animal's welfare, which also in turn protects the ethics of the animals because you can't keep an animal ethically without providing good welfare and you can't provide good welfare without good ethics. They're two sides of the same coin. And uh, ethics are covered in the, the licensing system in England. And I think that protects the animals both and also protects the public interest because if there's a licensing system in place, the public are then, even if they don't like to see it personally, and it's not their taste to see animals perform, they can still lie safe in the knowledge that there is a system in place, the animals are well looked after uh, and are well protected. Those that continue to enjoy circuses, which many do, um, are then free to go about the business and people like myself are free to continue running our business. And I think the licensing system is the only sort of ethical approach to it all. I mean, th there is ethical concerns to introducing the ban and Mexico is the biggest example of that. You know, the suffering that's happened there to the circus animals since a ban's been brought into place it, it is overwhelming to the point where the courts ended up overturning it and replaced it with a regulation system, which is now in place. And um, I'd like to just add to that because I think, you know, we're not ethicists, we're not philosophers, we, but we know right from wrong. And that's basically what you boil down to with ethics. And I'd like to just talk about Jolly Circus for a moment because it's not just what they do with their animals, it's how they treat their family, how they treat their staff, how they work out the moves where they're going to go next without any stress on the animals how they run their lives, how they bring up their children, how they treat their grandchildren. And all of this has a huge circle of ethics, and inside that is how they treat their animals. And to, to I don't believe you can separate one from the other. I, you know, if you've got bad people, they'll beat their kids and they'll beat their animals. And they beat their wife, probably, and go to the pub and they're nasty all round. But the, the two circuses that are licensed are both family businesses. Peter Jolly Circus has been operating for 46 years this year. They both, the, the, uh, Peter's wife, Carol, came from a long line of circus people. They have four children who all work with the circus. And the children all have little children. The older ones work in the circus in the afternoon. They have a roving tutor that comes to the circus to teach the children. When they're at winter quarters, their children go to the local school. The roving tutor works with the local school to make sure they're keeping to the curriculum. 
this is, this is all about ethics. This is what is right or wrong. And in the centre of it is their beloved animals. And that's what they live for. That's what they do. And I and they feel there should be some... What, what we're really worried about, and I think this affects us all, is it'll cause a domino effect. You ban up here, and Wales will ban. You, Wales bans, and Northern Ireland will ban, and then England will come in and ban. And this is grossly unfair to the people who are doing it correctly and keeping up ethical standards, looking after their families. And the other thing I think is really important that you understand, the circuses in the UK with wild animals, they're not huge affairs. They're small affairs where you can go with your granddad, with your grandmother, with all your kids, with your aunties, with your uncles. There's no rude jokes. There's no bare flesh. There's no nasty remarks or anything. It's just a family. They can go and have fun. So my next sort of point is, what's wrong with entertainment? Why? You say you can't have them in entertainment. If they're being looked after properly, if everything is right and they're being inspected and they've got everything, why not? Can we just follow up on that, uh, Anthony Beckwith, because um, your cats were at the centre of some controversy from some people's perspective in 2014-15 when they were wintered in Fraserborough. Now, you've explained in your written evidence the circumstances which led to members of the public seeing the cats. But from an ethical point of view and an animal welfare point of view, could you perhaps outline for us the conditions in which the cats were kept when they were winter quartered in Fraserburgh or anywhere else when, when you're doing that? Yeah, well, we've actually just finished building brand new enclosures, so it has recently changed since we're in Scotland. But the enclosures uh, are strictly covered under... Reg even when we're not covered under a circus licence, uh, we're covered under the DWA, which involves vet inspections anyway, so the enclosures, and that includes enrichment. And just the same way a zoo enclosure would, they have to be diverse. We, can't, we don't keep them in a lorry on the back of a truck, for example, as, as quite often misquoted. We do have a truck which makes up a sleeping den only. There's then a large build-up enclosure off it, which has platforms, a, a swimming pool, you know, logs, ropes, all, all that kind of thing, and the animals have access to either indoor or outdoor, except in this, if there was severe weather, then they'd be locked in the indoor. The same as in the zoo. Um, those enclosures are adaptable and portable, um, so that no matter where we go, they, have the, they can have the full enclosure, and we always have the, the facility to make it even bigger if required. Um, we've now got two separate enclosures, one for the lions, one for the tigers. They've both got all, all the, the same enrichment in, the scratching poles, uh, the, the platforms for climbing and everything. And that's the conditions are up in Scotland, and they were actually checked three times by vets during our stay in Scotland for the DWA licensing. And in terms of the size of the enclosures, are they comparable to, say, Edinburgh Zoo or other types of facilities? They, it, it depends on the zoos. I've actually been to some zoos where our enclosures are pretty much the similar size, um, like the Welsh Mountain Zoo, for example. But in, in general terms, the enclosures would be, would be smaller than a zoo. But the scientific studies show that size isn't, isn't the main factor in welfare. It's actually more the complexity and the enrichment, because you can have a, a huge enclosure, but if there's no mental stimulation, the animal will become bored, start showing stereotypical behaviours. Because our enclosure moves all the time, they've always got a new surrounding, uh, new terrain, and because they're learning, the mental stimulation is a lot higher. Um, they, they go from the, their enclosure into the tent, so they're always in different areas. Um, and they do have enough room still to be able to run around without hurting themselves. You know, they can run without bashing into anything. They can chase each other, as the lions often do. They can roll around. Um, there is plenty of room for them to exercise that. And the standards set out by DEFRA for the minimum size to meet the welfare needs, we're actually surpassing that by more than double um, for, for each animal. OK, OK, thank you for that. Uh, Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks, um, Camina. Good morning to the, the panel. Um, if I could turn to the issue of enforcement, uh, you'll all be aware of the provisions in Section 3 of the Bill, which uh, states that individuals will be held responsible where an organisation commits the, the offence and that there could be a situation where more than one person is deemed to be the, the operator. Uh, and, of course, you'll also be aware of the proposal to have local authority inspectors uh, to enforce the legislation, which we uh, covered with the previous panel. Um, I'd be keen to hear your views on... on on the proposed enforcement approach and 
would you say the proposed legislation is clear on what would constitute an offence? Sorry, could you say that last bit again, please? Yeah, are you, are you, um, I'd be keen to hear your views on the proposed uh, approach um, that's, that's in, the, in the bill. And would you say that the proposed legislation is clear on what would constitute an offence? I, th I think it has to be clear on what constitutes an offence. But I think that there should be provision whereby you don't take all circuses out for some bad circuses. There should be provision whereby the circuses that are allowed to keep wild animals and travel in Scotland should come under, as you say, what you would like to see would cause um, an offence. And therefore, it needs to be written into the bill that you can do this, you can't do that, you can do the other. Same as with the regulations in the UK. And you can add more. I mean, Wales, we, we, we helped the Welsh Assembly to put together their mobile animal exhibits. They wanted to do some test inspections to see how they would work out. And I went to Wales and helped them with the paperwork. And then we allowed them to come and inspect the two circuses that are licensed. And they went to Carol Circus Mondeo, and they came to Peter Jolly's. And I can send you, if you wish, their reports. They, it's strange because it's, it's how things are perceived. And part of the words that um, Andrew Voice said is that how it's perceived is when they first came to me and asked me if I would help them with this, they said, um, we, we, we want to start with circus because we think circus is going to be the most difficult because we heard that circus people are difficult and this is... And, and I said, oh, OK. And then we, we, I arranged it all and I said, well, you don't have to tell us when you're coming, just tell us the night before, or, you know, whatever you want to do, just come. And after they'd come and we sat, all sat down afterwards, they said, we thought circus was going to be difficult and we thought we were going to find things we didn't like, horrendous things, things that we'd heard they were doing. I mean, in, in Andrew Vose said about... Um, beating the animals and also dressing them up. Who in this day and age dresses up circus animals? Nobody. They, it just doesn't happen. So the thing is, with your bill, I think, uh, yes, there has to be a, a provision of what is an offence and who commits it. But I think there must be a provision in it to allow case-by-case -case circuses with wild animals to travel in Scotland. Anthony, did you want to come in? Yeah, I do think it is very unclear because my show, for example, there's four directors involved with running the show. Um, myself, Marilyn Chipperfield, Tommy Chipperfield and Thomas Chipperfield. Now, the animals actually belong to Thomas. If our show entered Scotland, who, who would be liable um, under the offence? Would it be myself as, as well as being one of the directors? Would it be all four of us? Would it be Thomas because he owns the animals? I don't think it, it's very clear. I can just, I meant to have said during that, which was what the question was, in the UK, uh, the English licensing, it is the person who owns the license who is responsible. Um, and that could be the cir circus operator, the person who owns the circus, or it could be delegated to one of his people, directors or whatever. However, if the offence is committed on the ground and is seen to be committed and the man who or woman who owns the license isn't there, it is the person who commits the offence is the person who's in charge because that person has allowed that offence to be committed. Of course, there are proposals in, in this bill that both individuals and organisations could be held criminal, criminally liable uh, for an offence under the legislation. So do you have a view on, on, on that? Well, no, I think, I think that's the probably the right way to go about it. You, you know, whoever's there and in charge, if you're left in charge of two camels, four zebras, you know, and somebody starts beating them or something dreadful happens and you don't stop it, you're in charge. You, you should go to prison. And with associations, I don't know, because that's, they don't, associations don't travel with the circuses. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's very important to remember with the circus, that um, most of the acts, whether they're animal acts or human acts, 
will be self-employed contractors. So as a circus director, I'm not employing any of these people. And there's very, very good reason why I'm not. I am not going to tell a trapeze artist how to swing on her trapeze, because if I do, and she subsequently falls, it's my fault. She will come to me at the start of the season and say, this is my act. Do you want to engage it, yes or no? I say yes. She's responsible for her own equipment. She's responsible for her own act. The same, of course, would apply um, with animal trainers. So if I were to book uh, an animal act, and they then subsequently abuse the animals, the only recourse I would have would be to dismiss them. I don't have the opportunity to say, I'm not happy with the way you do that. So I have to be careful in the first instance on, on who I choose to engage, uh, but ultimately my only recall, I can't say don't do that. I can only say go away. So just for clarification, in, view, in your view, um, it would be that self-employed person and no one else who would be... Uh, no, that isn't my view because I, I, I think I have a, a bigger responsibility as well as the director. But ultimately, I'm, I'm simply pointing out to you that... that if abuse were to happen, um, then it would start with the, with the trainer and the owner of the animals, not with the director. Okay, thanks. And um, finally, convener, there's um, the, the issue of the £5,000 a maximum fine. Um, do you have any views on that? I, I, I laughed when... Uh, the people from the local authority seem to think that we've all got 500 seats and we charge £10 for them and we could happily afford it. Um, you'd very quickly close a circus if you find it £5,000 once or twice. We see 200 people and charge £8. So. OK. Uh, I, I a thousand people and charge fifteen pounds, and you'd still very quickly close me if you charge me, find me £5,000. OK, thanks. Okay. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you. I just want to go back to the issue around wild animals. So you're talking about herbivores versus carnivores. Herbivores are easier domesticated, but my issue, are we really worried about big cats because they're carnivores? Are you suggesting they're domesticated? Or, and if you're training them or taming them, you know, I've seen video evidence that shows that uh, the lions seem a bit perturbed or unwilling to participate. So if you are engaging in training them or taming them, are you using positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement in order to engage in a behaviour that you want them to engage in? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Anthony is best qualified to answer your question, but I, I would like to ask you, do you know when you saw, when your video evidence was, was filmed? Um, things have changed. So uh, when... when Mike Radford did the Radford report for the British government. One of the things we refused to accept, I was part of that, um, was video evidence. Because what we see so often, and, and what we have seen as part of your process, is talk of dressing up animals. No, that certainly did happen. People used to, used to dress up animals. They certainly used to go at a lion with a wooden chair and the lion would smash the chair to bits and there'd be cracking of whips. That certainly did happen. We also used to put children up chimneys and get them to clean our, <laughs> our chimneys. The world has moved on. Um, I've, I, rate, I visit circuses two or three times a week. I can't tell you the last time I saw any animal dressed up. But, Sure, I, I can remember 40 years ago, people would uh, put a poodle in a dress and even get it to push a pram, but it's not what happens now. It's not what the public... Don't forget the public go and see a circus and, uh, and pay good money to go and see a circus and, and, and they, t they have a choice and, and they are not choosing to see that sort of thing anymore. They're not choosing to see um, the type of animal act where the animal 
is annoyed. What they want to do nowadays is, rather than a male um, with a ripped shirt cracking a whip at a lion, they'd rather see a female go in and cuddle and kiss the lion. That We have moved on, uh, and I'm afraid that so many people don't understand that when you look at video evidence from films taken 40, 50 years ago. I don't think this evidence was 40 or 50 years ago, but I do accept the point that some of the evidence that might be on YouTube... Um, and, and the caveat you know, I have to say is I'm talking about English training, so there are still parts of the world, of course, yeah. um, where not everybody has uh, moved into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Other than that, Anthony's the man who can... Yeah, like, like I mentioned at the beginning, the way our shoe works is about education and is about a training display, so we do demonstrate the training methods used. You did mention negative and positive reinforcement. Um, they're actually often misquoted. People think negative reinforcement is something bad where you'd maybe scold or hit the animal and positive is where you praise and reward it, and that's not actually the case. Positive and negative in operant condition mean the addition and removal of a stimulus. So if you offer an animal a, a, a reward and a stimulus, but, or you take that away, Taking it away is a negative reinforcement, adding it is positive reinforcement. There's also positive and negative punishment. Now, positive punishment would be the abuse of an animal, sort of like the physically hitting it or scalding it, and that is something we wouldn't do at all. We use the addition and the removal of praise and rewards. Um, we filmed all our training. It's available on our Facebook page. You can see how it's done. There's no whips involved at all. Uh, there's no chairs, there's no pistols as there would be in the old days. It's bamboo garden canes with bits of either horse or chicken meat on the end. And the animals are encouraged to follow sticks with never even, they're not chased or sent around, you know, you don't run after the animals, you get them to come at you and follow you. So similar with the, with the big cats, to get them to lie down, for example, you'd put the sticks in front of them and you'd pull them across the floor. And just like a house cat would, they go after them like that. You then get another stick and you give them a bit of meat you then send them back and it's the same with the jumping it's always following and encouraging that there's no sort of fear or dominance involved it, it's a working relationship and, and like martin said there's no that standoff fighting with an animal approach part of our act includes give the the male lion licking thomas's face and he does that of his own free will and you know there, there's no sort of tearing the head open and putting the head in the mouth like it would have been sort of 60, 70 years ago. It is very different and it's more a display of the relationship that man and animal can have rather than a display of dominance over animal, which it would have been a long time ago. Okay. Uh, Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, convener. I'll just uh, refer to my register of interest. Um, uh, maybe a question to Martin Burton. Um, you know, given you've said there have been no wild animals in circuses in Scotland in the last 12 months and only two in the previous five years, uh, what economic impact do you imagine that the bill uh, will have? Um, I, I think that the danger is, um, a, a, as other witnesses have told you, your definitions are not clear. Uh, and the, so the economic the economic impact on circuses with wild animals that are already not coming to Scotland will clearly be zero. The economic impact on uh, animal displays in shopping centres, on uh, displays uh, at outdoor shows of hawks and uh, uh, wild birds, the economic impact on, on reindeers, Santa and, and eventually zoos. Uh, will be massive because that that's where this will all go this will this will eventually close your zoos okay uh, rona brown um i'd just like to uh, pick up on that point as well because there is a gentleman who owns camels and he's great with his camels he looks after them extremely well but he travels around to county shows and he comes to Scotland. And he leaves home with his big truck, with his camels inside, pulling his living wagon behind. His staff, he also does pig racing. His staff come with the wagon with the pigs in, the truck with the pigs in, their living wagons, a car with another living wagon, and they travel. And they travel in England 
from one county show to another county show throughout the summer months. When he arrives on the show, and he gets there the night before because he's got to sort out all his camels and make sure everything's right, he pulls from the side of his truck the big tent awning out, and it's on post then. If it's bad weather, it's all enclosed in. He brings his camels out, and he ties them up to the side of the lorry. And he builds the pig fence, and the pigs come out and go in their fence, and he gets ready for the show. Now, during the show, he does camel polo. So you can play polo on a camel in a ring, obviously bigger than a circus ring. He does pig racing in a straight line. He does camel rides in a pig ring and camel racing in a straight line. And he moves from the one show to another show and stays there a couple of days while the show's on, does his work, and then he moves on to the next one. He might stop on the way if it's a week between, but and that's what he does during the summer months. Why is it that different from what the circuses do? How can you justify saying that's not a circus when you say a circus is under a tent and it's doing things in a ring to ed uh, entertain the public? Would, uh, your analogy would be dependent on which type of camels, given the evidence we heard earlier. Because I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Sorry, I, the point I'm making is that in terms of definition, it's wild animals and circuses. It would depend on which type of camels, given going back to Mr Beckwith's earlier evidence. Yeah, it is the same camels, the Bactrians, that the circuses use. All camels in captivity are the domesticated type. They're, there's very few wild ones left. The ones, the dromedary camels completely extinct in the wild. There's only a very small population of Bactrian camel left in the wild. It's critically endangered. And there is a feral group of camels in Australia, but they're bred from domesticated lines. There isn't actually, there's very few wild camels left in the world. Most of them are domesticated. Certainly all the ones in captivity are domesticated. So, so while I was recognising the point you're trying to make, the fact is they wouldn't be covered because they're not wild animals. So I could come here with my wild animals once the bill's in force with my circus, with my two camels. Are they wild? Are they not wild? Well, it would depend on the definition. Well, they're the same as the ah. <laughs> Is it just the word circus that we're, we're, we've got a problem with? Oh, it's with? wild animals and circus, so it would depend on the animal, and travelling circuses yeah. as well, so they're queer definitions. That's the point I'm getting. I understand the point you're trying to make, yeah. but those animals, this would not be covered because they're not wild animals. That, well, that, well, then that, neither of the circuses your... on Peter Joey's wild animals or Carol's wild animals. Sorry. Does, doesn't your bill refer to um, domestic animals that are domesticated in the UK? Mm. No. <laughs> it does. So that would take the camels out. I give is the scientific definition, but the definition in the bill isn't that that's animals not normally domesticated in the UK. Mm. Uh, which is completely different because there's animals that are farmed in the UK quite extensively that come under the, the taxonomy of wild, such as ostriches, crocodiles, that kind of thing. But then there's animals that are not farmed. Um, the the wild yeah, buffalo, yeah. Wild buffalo. Yeah, well, it, yeah, the American and the American bison. But they, but then you when you look at the domesticated animals that we would class as wild for the purpose of the bill that actually aren't wild. But then there's other animals that are wild that wouldn't be covered if you look at the definition in the bill because they are farmed in this country quite extensively. I mean, there's, I think there's over about t between 10 and 15,000 ostriches farmed in the UK every year, so... But they're a wild animal. Classification, they are wild. They're not domesticated, but they are farmed in the UK. OK, right. Richard Lyle. Two questions. One to Martin Burton. I was at uh, Blue Drummond Safari Park on Sunday with my grandkids and uh, the place was... Uh, excellent, apart from the, some showers. We went in to see a seal show, and the seals, two seals come out and they performed tricks and clapped their, right, their, their, their fins to get people clapping. Do you, I've been at the Penguin Parade in Edinburgh Zoo. Um, the point you've made, could this be the start of all these things being done away with because people... Uh, uh, let me finish, Martin because people are, a, are concerned about animal welfare. And can I say that I am for animal welfare, and I'm not on the side, because I'm the cross-party chairman of the Showman's Guild, doesn't mean I'm on your side, guys. I've got to say I'm on the side of 
what's best for animals. But, but I said at the outset that I'm an animal welfareist too. That, but once you start banning things, is particularly banning things on ethical grounds, it is clear that this will spread because if it's ethically not right to have a wild animal in a circus, then it's ethically not right to have a wild animal appear at a gala or a county show, and it's ethically not right to have an animal appear, a wild animal appear in a shopping centre, and it's ethically not right to have a, a wild animal appear in a zoo. It is clear and logical that that's where the only way an ethical ban can go. You can't choose your ethics. You're either going to say this is ethical or it is not ethical. Can I ask my last question to Rona Brown? Over the last couple of years, number of years, being the chairman of the Showman's uh, Cross Party Group, I've came across showmen, and you're not gypsies, you're not travellers, you basically have your own ethnicity. Do you see this as an infringement of your right and your ethnicity? And, and your right to work? Yes, I do. I think there's, there's several um, laws that would cover that. You know, the, the EU services um, right to, to travel, you, you would fall f f uh, foul off. Incidentally, Jolly, Jolly, Peter Jolly Senior is a member of the Showman's Guild, has been all ever since he started. Um, so yes, I think, it, I think it would be an infringement and particularly for these two smaller circuses, Carol's is a family circus. That is is like it's it's like it's unethical to do it because you can. Why do it just because you can? And there's no reason when they're not doing anything wrong. We know right from wrong. We know it's wrong to beat animals. So why ban them if they're not doing that? Why ban them? If they're leaving them out in the cold, or they're leaving them to, you know, if they are doing those things, then yes, you can't come here, you're banned. But if they're not, I think it would be an infringement on their rights, on the workers' rights. What is a family like the Jollies going to do when they own, they don't outsource acts, they don't buy in acts, anything. Not the aerial acts, nothing. The whole family does the show. Nobody gets hired in. They did outsource once, um, and, but that was only once. But everything's, everything is around the animals. They all take turns with training. They've got a, a little educated pony where the children come in and the, the, the ringmaster says, how old are you? And he says, how old do you think the, this young man, what's your name? And, how old? and the pony goes with his hoof, and that's training. It, it, you know, and it, the public love it. They love it when the camels come in. They absolutely love to see the fox on the back of the donkey. A fox. Is that and a, a domesticated fox? <laughs> <laughs> it's indigenous to the UK, but it's still, according to DEFRA, a, a wild animal, and it has to be licensed. Yeah. And they have, a, they have a macaw, a parrot, and that comes in and talks and does things. And also they do educational talks in, in the zoo afterwards when the people go, when the show's finished, people go out to look at the animals, how they're fed, how they live, and they do educational talks. Yeah, it's not talking about elephants in Africa. It's not talking about elephants in Asia or sea world or sea life. It's talking about this little zebu. They've got a zebu. It's talking about where it comes from, what it does, how it came to be doing this, what the background is. And the same with the fox, same with the camel, same with the zebras. They, this is what these people do. And it would be, in my opinion, grossly unfair to class all circuses the same. Pick up, you, you touched on zebras there, just to wrap this up. Carol McManus, you were telling us earlier about the two zebras that you had. And, and the behaviour they exhibited. Um, do you think it's the case that wild animals can become domesticated over a period of time? Yeah, why not? I've just taken on a, a young horse this year. Um, we've had him maybe three months. We've had to castrate him because he's quite wild. <laughs> um, 
I cracked my ribs, unloaded him. Um, another day, he kicked somebody else in the face. We've never had that with our zebras. So which was the more wild? The wild horse, who's really domesticated, or the wild zebra, who appears to be more domesticated? <laughs> yeah. OK, well, on that thoughtful note, let's conclude this. Can I thank the witnesses from this panel and from the other panels today? You've given us a lot of... So questions to take away from that. So it's been very useful from our point of view. Thank you for your time. You. Um, at its next meeting on the 13th of June, the committee will take further evidence from stakeholders on the Wild Animals and Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. The committee will also take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform on the draft Protected Animals Exemption Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017, followed by consideration of mo motion S5M05754. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private session and I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.